Thanks so much, Brett. Good morning, everyone. Thanks to the worship team. Uh, my name is Justin Tamlin, and I really, really count it a privilege to open God's Word to you this morning. In 1994, a Korean air jet overshot the runway and crashed into a barricade uh, in poor weather. All 160 passengers on board, thankfully, managed to escape to safety just moments before the aircraft burst into flames. The news report said that the pilot and the co-pilot were fighting over the controls. One of them wanted to do a second approach and the other one wanted to land immediately and as they began to fight over control, they crashed that plane and almost endangered the life and the lives of all passengers and crew. As I thought about that story, I thought that you and I love to be in control. And as we look at the things in our life and the, the stress that they cause us, we, we still won't let go of those controls. We, we say, I, I have to be in charge. We say, I, I, I have to be concerned about my family. I, I have to provide for them. I have to protect what I've built. I have to. It's, it's, it's in our nature somehow. And we, we stressed about all sorts of things. We stressed about money and we stressed about work and we stressed about relationships and we stressed about things in our family and stressed about our country and stressed about unknown futures. But trying to control everything wearies us out. And when the stress levels get really high, you know where we go for a little bit of comfort? We come over here and we seek out comfort in, in sensual pleasure, in entertainment in what's immediately gratifying, in food, in ice cream, in drink, in sex, in entertainment. We, we bury our heads in our phones and we try and escape from that stress that we realize we're actually not really able to control. And I don't know about you, but everywhere I look, not only at some pastors I know across the nations, but many people that I know closer to home, even in our church, when I look out, I see people who are crashing across the runway. Their lives are out of control, even as they try and maintain control, and they're crashing physically. They're crashing emotionally. They're crashing spiritually. And you know what the Lord Jesus Christ sees as he looks out across our city, across our church, across our nation, across our world? Our Lord Jesus Christ looks out, and he sees crowds that are harassed and helpless, and why are those crowds harassed and helpless? Jesus tells us in Matthew 9, because they are like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd. And, and the tragedy for us this morning is that we could be here at Rosebank Union Church. We could claim that we have a shepherd, but we could walk out into Monday and we could live as though we look like a rest and helpless sheep without a shepherd, when all the time we actually have the great shepherd as our shepherd. And so I want us to begin a six-part meditation on Psalm 23. We're not going to rush through this. We're not going to stress ourselves out. We're going to go slowly, a verse per week. Can you believe that? And I'm hoping to keep you awake because you're going to say, well, I've read the psalm. I know the psalm. What on earth is he going to tell us for six weeks from God's word? But that's the problem. We don't meditate. We don't mind deeply. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to look at the first three verses, then God willing, we're going to take a break in the middle for Rays of Hope Sunday, and then we're going to come back, God willing, and look at another uh, three verses, the final three. I think the important thing for us to recognize is that you can know Psalm 23. It's probably the most well-known section of Scripture. Maybe you went to a school where you were forced to memorize it in chapel. Maybe you've heard it at gravesides. You've heard it mentioned. You've memorized it yourself. You can know Psalm 23, but you can fail to know the shepherd of Psalm 23. And while the psalm is so well known to us, I think that Psalm 23 in our Santan culture can perhaps be the most foreign section of Scripture in our experience. It maybe sounds like some kind of old black and white movie from a bygone era with sort of slow motion grass blowing in the wind, and, but it's reality. And I want to expose that reality to us. Psalm 23 has been called the Psalm of Psalms. It's been called the Pearl of Psalms. It's been called a jewel of pure gold amongst the many jewels of Scripture. And this probably is my favorite Psalm too. We've produced this little leaflet and I encourage you not to throw it away. 
On the back is a little blurb and an outline of where we're going. And then this beautiful sort of, um, it's not really a poem, but it's, a, it's an explanation of each part of Psalm 23 from an unknown source. The Lord is my shepherd, that's relationship. I shall not be in want, that's supply. He makes me lie down in green pastures, that's rest, and so on. I encourage you, keep this in your Bible, put it next to your bed. Be meditating. We need to get the truth of God down into our hearts. But I want to read just part of the quote that's on the front there by Henry Ward Beecher. Beecher said that Psalm 23 is the nightingale of the Psalms. It has charmed more griefs to rest than all the philosophy of the world. It has sung courage to the army of the disappointed. It has poured consolation into the heart of the sick, of captives in dungeons, of widows in their pinching griefs, of orphans in their loneliness. Dying soldiers have died easier as it was read to them. Ghastly hospitals have been illuminated. It has visited the prisoner and broken his chains, nor is its work done. It will go on singing to your children and my children and to their children through all the generations of time. And if we could think of every single person who has been encouraged by this psalm and the fact that the Lord is their shepherd over the millennia, Man, what a, an army, a vast army of those who have been blessed by the psalm. Well, David begins Psalm 23, and please feel free to open it in your pew Bible. He begins in Psalm 23 by saying, The Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. Do you know what that statement says about you and I? David is implying something when he says, The Lord is my shepherd, and it's something that's not too flattering. Do you know what he's implying? It's implying that you and I are sheep. Sheep. Ordinary little sheep. Now, if you've been around church for a while, we kind of know that jargon, you know, shepherds, sheep, pastors, that whole imagery. But when you really think about it, it's not very flattering to be called a sheep. And I came across a sermon this past week by a pastor by the name of Ben Stewart, and I really enjoyed some of what he says. So let, let me paraphrase a bit of what he was saying. He says, How many people do you know who've got a tattoo of a sheep on their arm? Anybody? Those hardcore guys, they put tattoos there, right down their their bicep. What, What do they put on there? They put on lions, they put on massive dragons. Nobody thinks to put on a sheep. And if they did, they say, yeah, look at the sheep I've got. It's just there to remind me that I'm weak, that I'm helpless. And think about sheep. Just look at a sheep. It's almost as though nature itself has fine-tuned a sheep to be eaten by almost every kind of animal. (laughs) Think of the predators of sheep. You have bears, you have wolves, you have lions, even small dogs. You have birds of prey that can come and strike the sheep from the air. We'll talk about that in the next couple of weeks. You've got flies, you've got insects. I've read accounts of, of sheep that would be so annoyed by insects. And we'll come to look at that when we think about what does it mean to have our head anointed with oil, that the the poor sheep will be driven crazy and will just keep hitting its head against the tree to maybe cause death or some kind of relief. A sheep can't protect itself very well. Think about the design of a sheep. Sheep don't have claws. They don't have fangs that can bite with poison. I mean, sheep can't camouflage themselves, they're bright white. It's like, look at me, I'm hiding in the middle of a dark field. (laughs) Sheep can't swim. Have you ever tried to put on a woolen jersey and go for a swim? You just sink. Sheep can't climb up trees, they can't run very fast. They just go, ma'am, and and it's over for them. They they, they just don't, don't, don't get very far. But not only can sheep not protect themselves, they can't even provide for themselves. They dehydrate easily. We'll see next week that they refuse to drink from fast running water. They won't. They'll stand there, their little tongue is going, (laughs) and they will not drink because they're afraid. That's the nature of sheep. And, And when sheep are stressed, because they are, they're jittery animals just like us when they get stressed, they'll rather seek out contaminated puddles of water that are polluted with parasites and poo, and they'll stand there, and they'll just keep going back to the same filth over and over and over again, not recognizing the harm that they're doing to themselves. They cannot hunt for food. They can't take care of themselves if they get injured. 
Friends, without a shepherd, a sheep can do pretty much nothing. A sheep can do nothing without a shepherd. And I look at all of this and I see you and I, I see us stressed out, I see us anxious, I see us worried, I see us jittery, I see us just feeling just consumed and and trying to control everything in this side of life and, and, and then we can't control it so we go to these streams that are polluted and these puddles that are polluted and we go back again and again and again hoping to find nourishment. And we cry, who will lead me? Who's going to comfort me? Who's going to protect me in this scary world? Who's going to give me satisfaction? But there's only one who can. And that's where David starts in Psalm 23. He starts with him, the only one who can. And look what he says in verse 1. The Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. And you'll notice that the word Lord is capitalized to distinguish it from a different Hebrew word, which is normal law, just Capital L and then all small case. This is capital Lord. This is a translation of God's most sacred and beautiful personal covenant name. This is Yahweh. We don't even know how to pronounce this word. We say Yahweh, but it's actually in the Hebrew Y-H-W-H. We don't know what the vowels were. The Jews wouldn't even pronounce this word. Translated, it means I am. I've been as sick as a sheep this past week, so I need to keep drinking uncontaminated water. (coughs) Excuse me. Let's see how we go. I am. I am is my shepherd, says David. The eternal, unchanging, all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present, I am. This is the Lord that is my shepherd. Every orbit, every heartbeat, every atom, every lung is dependent on the great I am for its existence. What credentials? Is there a problem for you as a sheep that is too big to solve? Well, do pray for me. I've been off most of this week. So let's see how we go. I got through eight. I don't know how many strepsils a person is legally allowed to take. (coughs) But um, whoever brands strepsils, they clearly don't work. (coughs) Excuse me. Not only does it sound terrible, I probably look terrible. I don't know what I look like on a screen coughing. But it can't be good. I want you to see what credentials the shepherd has. You might be feeling that you have a burden that is too big to bear. Are his resources enough for me? Lord, there's a mystery in my life that took place maybe years ago and it's, it's too complex for me to fathom. Lord, are you strong enough? Are you big enough? Can you come and close enough? Can you, can you bind up my wounds as a sheep? A sheep, I want you to know this morning that the Lord is your shepherd. What credentials. But David also says, not only the Lord is my shepherd, he says the Lord is my shepherd. What confidence. David says the Lord is. Not the Lord was my shepherd. Not I used to trust him in the past. You know, when when things were going well, I mean, and now I find myself in this valley of the shadow of death. I can't believe God would have brought me here. How's this going to help me? The Lord was my shepherd. I'm not sure I can trust him here now. No, David says the Lord is my shepherd. Not the Lord will be. You know, Lord, when I get out of this mess, when I've cleaned up my act, when I've pulled myself together, when I've really got back into the swing of things, Lord, then I'll trust you again. No, the Lord is my shepherd. Right now, right here in this place, in both the green pastures and in Death Valley, the ever-present I am is my shepherd. What confidence. But David also says, <coughs> the Lord is my shepherd. Closeness. What closeness? What credentials, what confidence, what closeness. I know him. I am his and he is mine. Look at Psalm 23. Glance at it. You know what you won't see there? You won't see we or us or they. You'll only see my, me, I and you. The Lord is my shepherd. 
David's not saying the Lord, the Lord is my spouse's shepherd, the Lord is my friend's shepherd, the Lord is the, 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 the shepherd or the person sitting next to me this morning. No, can you say the Lord is my shepherd? I think back over all the years of being a pastor, and I think of many, many people that have left the church. And they've left the church often because they were living off the experience of other people's experience of the shepherd. And they went to holiday clubs, they went on the church camps, they maybe even attended a Bible study. They looked around, they tried to play the part, they raised their hands at the right time. They did all the right things, but it was hollow hype. They tried hard to look the part and do the God thing, but they gave up because it was too hard to pretend. They got hooked on people. They got hooked on a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a spouse who dragged them to church. They got hooked on a pastor or they got hooked on a vibe or they got hooked on a particular style of music or a particular church, but they never got hooked on the Savior. Christianity just became a social thing, a club. And so I say to you, you may know Psalm 23, but do you know the shepherd? Do you know the shepherd? This is the source and the fountain of the psalm. Everything that David is going to say flows from here. For six weeks, I'm going to be saying the same thing because that's what David does. The psalm is over the minute he said, the Lord is my shepherd. But he's going to spend six verses unpacking that. And if you don't know the shepherd, if you don't know the source, you dare not enjoy the blessings downstream because they're not for you. You will not experience them until you've gone to the fountain of all life and blessing. The Lord is my shepherd. How wonderful for us to meditate as we go out into this week and to say to ourselves, the Lord is my shepherd. What credentials. The Lord is my shepherd. What confidence. The Lord is my shepherd. What closeness. And then the Lord is my shepherd. What condescension. What condescension. What a scandalous thought. How dare David bring this I am Yahweh Almighty, all-sufficient, ever-present God down to the level of smelly sheep? How dare he associate the Lord with shepherd? Isn't that scandalous? How dare he do such a thing? How condescending. But it wasn't presumption on David's part because throughout the scriptures, God has revealed himself as a shepherd. Here's just three verses, and we could have looked at hundreds. Genesis 49, God describes himself as the shepherd of Israel. Isaiah 40, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. And in the New Testament, Jesus says in John 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. And we were singing it this morning. Yes, the Lord is a strong tower. Yes, he's a rock. Yes, he's a shield. Yes, he's a refuge. Yes, he's all those things and many other beautiful images. But in Psalm 23, he's my shepherd. He's my shepherd. And one commentator says that this statement, the Lord is my shepherd, links a lump of common clay to divine destiny. Links a lump of common clay to divine destiny. A mere mortal becomes the cherished object of divine diligence. If you know the shepherd and he knows you, you are a lump of clay that has been linked with divine destiny and you are his most cherished possession. And he will be diligent in his love and shepherding of you. I think to myself, the Lord could have just remained the Lord. But he chose to marry the word Lord with the word shepherd. He chose to do that willingly. He wrapped up his lordship with your sheepness. Why? Why did he do that? Why does a school counselor that I used to know work long hours with rebellious teenagers in a high school who don't want that counselor's help? Long hours, day in and day out. Why? Why does a paramedic that I know post on his Facebook status around Christmas about all the struggles of being a paramedic and trying to save the life of a drunkard and having that drunkard curse at him and vomit on him and fight him off and yet he's fighting to save his life? Why? Why does a lady I know go into a hospice township and that's her ministry? All she does is clip the toenails of people that are suffering with HIV. Why does a family from Rosebank Union Church give up their comforts and go out into the foreign mission field? Why does an elderly wife spend all that time and all that energy 
invested in loving her frail husband when she's a complete stranger to him. He can't even remember her name. And sometimes he thinks she's his mother. Sometimes she thinks he thinks she's a stranger. Why does she do that? And if you're a parent this morning, can I ask you something maybe you haven't thought about? Why do you love your kids? I know you think about it actually all the time. Why do you love your kids? I said to Liesl a couple of weeks ago, I'm actually just going to do some calculations and see how much it costs to raise a child. Crunch those numbers. Education. Every single little piece of food. Every little drink you've bought. Every glass that they drink out of. I mean, all of that baby equipment that we need. Just add that up over 18 years. But it's not. They're millennials. They're going to be in your home till they're 35. <laughs> so double that amount. Double that amount. And they won't just want the PlayStation, they'll want the Xbox, they'll want all of them for their 30th birthday. So this is, you're in for the long haul. Why do you love your kids? Why? Do you know what the answer is? To all these questions, the answer is unanswerable. There's a mystery, there's a wonder, there's a love, there's a, there's a wow. The distance between the Lord and shepherd is an infinite distance that goes far further than any of those examples I've given you. And the Lord humbles himself and becomes a shepherd. But I need to say that I've actually lied to you because that's not true. He went far further than that. He didn't just move from being the Lord to shepherd. He actually went from shepherd to being a sheep. He clothed himself in your wool and he took on your sheepness. This is an astounding thought that should never get old in our hearts. The scriptures tell us he was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is silent so he did not open his mouth. Do you realize that the cry of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, precedes the comfort of Psalm 23. You can't enjoy Psalm 23 if you don't flip back and see what happened to Christ prophetically in Psalm 22. Psalm 22 precedes Psalm 23, and you can't have the crown of glory in Psalm 24 if you haven't made your way through the valley of the shadow of death up into glory in Psalm 22. These are in context, 22, 23, 24. They're there for a reason in that order. And your good shepherd in Psalm 22 walked through that valley, stared it in the face, and burst through the gates of death on the other side so that when you come to that valley in Psalm 23, even though you can't see him, he can take you by the hand and he can lead you on and up onto the heights of summer grazing. So dear sheep, can I ask you a question? Why are you still wanting this morning? Why are you still panting after false shepherds, still going back again and again to the pollution? Why? Do you really want to go back to your old life, to your old stomping ground, to be part of Satan's old flock? Yes, we're all born with Satan as our shepherd, and unless we've turned and trusted Christ, unless he's come and found us, we will remain part of Satan's flock. But even once Christ has found us, we sometimes say, oh, that's boring. That's not fun. This is life. This is joy. This is peace. This is satisfaction. But I want to tell you, Satan's flock is thin and weak, Satan's flock is emaciated. They, they're infested with flick, uh, flicks and teas. Uh, t- uh, what is it? Ticks and fleas. <laughs> flicks and teas. <laughs> Gee, sounds like some medication I need to be taking. Anyone got some flicks and teas I can take off to the service? I mean, they're weak. Satan's posture is dry. It's unsatisfying. And if the Lord is your shepherd, his glory is at stake in how you look. And if you're resting in him, you'll know deep contentment in Christ's love and provision. I think you know as well as I do that sheep are prone to deception. And you could be sitting here this morning saying, of course I believe the Lord is my shepherd. But what you say you believe and what's really going on can be two different things. We can say we believe this, but then I want to challenge you. Look at your actions, look at your behavior, look at your emotions, look at your desires, look at your wants. That is a mirror to say, 
do I really believe that's true? Because when I look at the way I'm living, if I look at my emotions, if I look at my jitteriness, if I look at all of that, what is it saying about what I believe? The Lord is my shepherd will show in how my contentment affects my wants. And so we move on to the last part of verse 1. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. It's almost like we could put the therefore. Therefore I shall not want. There's a logical conclusion. If he's my shepherd, then I shall not want. If, then. You've got the old 1984 NIV in the pew in front of you, which says I shall not be in want. The new NIV says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing which is also a great translation. So maybe you're asking like I am, what does this mean? Is this a a, a prosperity gospel? Is David saying, I'll I'll never want for anything. I'll be rich. I'll be healthy. (coughs) Healthy? Um, No. Will I have whatever finances I want, the home I want? Is that what he's saying? No, Psalm 23 affirms the fact that sheep do lack certain things at certain times and in certain seasons. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, the shepherd is taking the sheep through the valley. And what do they lack in the valley? They lack the light of the sun. They lack the warmth of the sun. They lack the green pastures. They lack the the, the cool, quiet waters. So how do we understand what David's saying? I think one modern translation captures the sense of Psalm 23 and verse 1 really well. It reads, The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. I have everything I need. That's quite challenging because the fighter in me, the, the, the stubborn sheep in me says, that's not true. There's a ton of stuff I can think of that I need that I don't have. And I can think of all the exceptions to the rule and I think of people I know in circumstances. But David is saying, actually, I have everything I need. He's saying, I will not lack anything at any time that the shepherd thinks is best for me. Friends, you believe that in your behavior and in your heart and in your emotions that I will not lack anything at any time that the shepherd thinks is best for me. Because when you find contentment in Christ, it's having an awareness that actually Christ is the most important thing that I really need. If death is my greatest fear, the only way to be delivered from death is in Christ. If the thing I'm most searching for today is a perfect relationship And I'm looking for it. Where's this perfect relationship? My friend, every person, every marriage, every spouse will ultimately let you down in some way. Why? Because you were designed to be fulfilled in relationship with your shepherd. And you live your life out of an overflow of that and you exercise grace to the people around you as they do to you because you cannot expect people to be God to you. Recognizing what you have in Christ is recognizing that you have the most important thing. As I was preparing this message, I was thinking back on the day that I, I married Liesl. I can't even see her. Liesl, are you here? Oh, there you are. So I'm going to get a bit romantic. We'd been apart for just one month short of two years. She was studying teaching in Cape Town. I got a call into ministry after finishing Bible college to Howick in KwaZulu Natal. And I said goodbye, and we were apart. That was a long time ago. They, you know, there was telecom call more time, seven rand for the weekend or something, and you'd phone on the Friday, and you wouldn't hang up, and you'd just shout on the phone so that you didn't have to like, you know, waste an extra seven rand. Those were the, 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 the terrible days where technology was lacking. But I remember on my wedding day thinking, oh, I don't have to say goodbye to her again. I don't have to put on the bus, put on the airplane. Uh, we're going to be together forever. She was a student earning zero. I was a brand new pastor. They told me they wouldn't really be able to pay me much. I didn't know what pastors should be paid, so it didn't really bother me at the time. And um, the church said, we can't afford to give you a vehicle, so I walked everywhere, and then a family in the church said, here's a bicycle for you. And so, did I have lacks? Yeah, did I have things in my life that were missing? Did I have wants? Yeah, as I thought, gee, I've only got a couple of hundred rand left at the end of every month to, to plan a wedding to think, well, maybe we can't go on honeymoon. And, and God provided and, and in amazing ways that I won't go into now. But I remember seeing Liesl coming down the aisle and thinking, doesn't matter what I have, doesn't matter where we live, the fact that God is my shepherd and she's going to be my wife, that's actually all that I need. Come what may, wherever the Lord should call us, wherever he should take us, she will be my wife until that day when he calls her home. We're finally together. 
And that's all that really matters. And maybe I was young, maybe I was naive, but I wonder as I look back, if there's not something significant in that kind of perspective on life and finding contentment in Christ and saying, Lord, actually if I have you, yes, it doesn't mean that I, I just become a zombie and all my desires and needs and wants go away, but they become secondary. It's, it's I have you and, and Lord, that's okay. If you and I are together, we, we can conquer whatever life's gonna throw at us. And I think when we flirt with the world, when we go back to those puddles, we're actually saying the one that, that I love is insufficient. That one that's supposed to love me, oh, he doesn't satisfy my needs. Every time we sin, we are laying a charge against God that our shepherd is inadequate in some ways and he's a poor lover of my soul. And we chase shepherd substitutes instead of allowing our contentment in him to slowly wean us from these things that we think are such great wants and needs, and yet they may not be. I think of when I go shopping on an empty stomach. It's terrible. Don't go to Food Lovers Market, don't go to Woolworths, don't go to any grocery store on an empty stomach. Because every single product somehow knows my name. They all have voices and I can hear them saying, Justin, Justin, Justin. Especially that, that ice cream fridge. I don't know, it's like a whole chorus of choirs of 1.5 and 2 liter ice creams. And if you check, it's not 2 liters anymore. They're made of 1.8. They've snuck it in there. There's some information for you. But they're all calling my name. Justin, Justin, buy me, eat me, drink me, feed on me. I will bring you life. And so, there's a great blessing. And that is to shop on a well-satisfied full stomach. Everything is seen for what it is. Liar. Cheater, make me fat, stupid, whatever product you are. We see everything in its right perspective. Why? Because we're content, we're satisfied. And yes, there are secondary gifts, but those secondary gifts of God make terrible gods. They make terrible shepherds. When we see them for what they are, we can rightly enjoy them instead of using them. I'm convinced that if you were to read the book of Ecclesiastes, the secret to the book of Ecclesiastes is that when you see everything as something to be gained, to be God to you, you will use it, you will abuse it, and it will leave you empty. And when you see every secondary thing as a pure gift from God, you can actually truly enjoy it for what it is and not be consumed by it. And so, can you say that? Can you say the Lord is my shepherd, that's all I want. That was another beautiful translation. The Lord's my shepherd, that's all I want. Yes, there are other things here, but, but they're not really what I want. Lord, you what I want. Take a look at the screen. You fill in the blank. We said the Lord is my shepherd, but that may not be the case with you. Self may be your shepherd. You, you fill it in. Money is my shepherd. Success is my shepherd. Approval is my shepherd. My family, as good as they are, is my shepherd. My spouse is my shepherd. My business, my pleasure, my sex, my alcohol, my pornography, both good and bad is my shepherd. Sheep will always follow something. We can't help it. We will follow someone or something. And would we trust things that are decaying and not eternal and not lasting and not ever present instead of the one who is? And so as we close, I just want to ask a few quick questions to help you determine why you might be struggling with contentment in Christ. Just four questions, jot them down, pop them in your phone, maybe one will stand out for you, and you say to yourself, hey Lord, as I go back this week, meditate on this psalm, really dig deep, maybe this is why I'm struggling. I believe you're my shepherd, but Lord, I'm struggling with the I shall not be in one side. Number one, just ask yourself, Am I confusing my needs and wants? I mean, we've spoken about it. That's what advertisers do. They love to convince us that we need more, the latest, the greatest, the best, and they're shouting at us. And as we said, when you're content in Christ, you can truly enjoy things. Love and joys, lust uses. Another question, number two. Am I more focused on what I don't have rather than what I do have? And I think of a trip to Durban on the N3, which is something we do to escape the stress as well. We think Durban's going to be our hope for the long weekend, and it never is. Never is. 
But as I was going down that N3, there'd been beautiful rains, the pastures were green, and I saw this uh, flock of sheep, and uh, they were just enjoying this grass, except for one little sheep. He was pushed against the barbed wire fence on the side of the N3. I was convinced that he was trying to push this body through, even if this barbed wire ripped his flesh off. I don't know why. He wanted to like, just get out there onto that road and to see what it felt like to be hit at high speed. And he's got his mouth through the fence and he's eating the most disgusting looking tufts of grass covered in tar and carbon monoxide and whatever from all the trucks that go right past there, but forcing his way. And as I saw that image, I thought, maybe that's a picture of me, maybe it's a picture of you. That we're not content with what we have. We've got this whole field of abundance, green pastures, and yet we will keep pressing through the fence and focused on what we don't have because it's off limits, it's inaccessible, and we think somehow that'll bring us life. Number three, am I more focused on the immediate rather than the bigger picture? Some of you have been through very, very difficult times. That valley of the shadow of death is a frightening place, it's a place that, that has deep and dark shadows. It's a place of, of, of fear and of loss and of grief where certain things are missing, where life is uncertain, things are, are, are jittery. And what you might do in that moment is allow that to reinterpret the long haul of the journey you've been on. And that's a very possible reality that you will look at the exceptions, you will look at the problems, you will look at the deep loss in your life and you will say, no, I can't. Maybe the Lord isn't my shepherd. Maybe I'm a goat. Maybe I've got this wrong. And I want to encourage you, don't just allow the immediate, as painful as it is, to stop you. Recognize that this is a thoroughfare. He's leading you through. Don't stop there. Look back on your journey and say, yes, there have been great joys. There's been green pastures and, and, and lush fields and and." Beautiful, cool streams of water. And yes, after this moment, there's coming great things, anointed heads and overflowing cups. Lord, let me look at the full long haul and recognize that even in this moment, if I feel I don't understand, Lord, may these other moments here prepare me for this moment. May these things interpret this, not this, interpret all of that. The shepherd knows the whole journey. And both through the good and the bad, he is leading you somewhere. He's not less the shepherd. He knows he's leading you somewhere and there's no other way around and that's the way through. Augustine once said, God would never permit evil if he could not bring good out of evil. And I have to believe that. The fourth and final question. Am I secretly wanting to be the shepherd instead of the sheep? Fighting over the controls of the airplane of my life, fighting with the pilot, not recognizing that actually I'm the passenger. That was the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden. That was their temptation. You're missing out. You could be like God. And that's the thing we will fight till the day we die. We want to be God. We want to be sovereign. We want to be all wise. We want to be all knowing. We want to have it all figured out. We want to be God. And contentment in Christ is a recognition that, hang on a minute, I'm the sheep. And you know that it's actually the most liberating thing to realize that you're not the shepherd, that you're the sheep. It brings freedom. But wanting to be God brings bondage because you can't be God. That's why you're so stressed up. That's why you can't control everything because you're not God. We make terrible gods. You were never meant to be the shepherd. And so I close with this thought. Some of you travel a lot. Some of you less so. Some have the opportunity to go on holidays some less so. But I think we all know when we look at our kids when they're with us and we're taking them on an adventure somewhere, somehow our kids don't seem to stress about stuff, particularly if you're traveling internationally. And I think of a recent trip that Liesl and I had the privilege of going on. I mean, our girls are teenagers. They're not faced. They've got their iPads. They've got music in their ears. Nothing really seems to bother them. It doesn't mean that as sheep they don't sometimes fight and they get irritated. When are we going to get there? Why is this long? Why is that boring? Do we have to go here? There's all of that. But on the whole, mom and dad carry the burden for that trip. And when things go wrong, they're not really stressed about it. If a passport falls down a stormwater drain, it's like, oh, okay. Do you understand the implications of that? Do you know what that means? The flight was canceled. Oh, okay, cool. Well, uh, that vending machine looks nice. We'll go over there. They, they, they don't feel the burden. 
And when GPSs break and, and, and things go wrong, and I remember us being in New York and having to catch a bus somewhere and being told, oh, well, you booked your ticket so early six months ago, that bus company's gone bankrupt. So <laughs> we don't even know who you are, you don't exist. It's the 26th of December. Where are you going to go in New York and find accommodation at a reasonable price and miss your connecting flight? And Amber and Summer, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> that's the reality. And I think to myself, if my daughters can trust in my all-sufficiency on a trip, when I'm a frail dad, I'm weak, I'm stressed out, things go wrong in my life, sometimes it says insufficient funds, sometimes the credit card has disappeared, sometimes it doesn't work, and my resources are limited, and my wisdom is limited, and I'm lost, and I don't know where we're supposed to be, they just assume, oh, dad knows what's going on here, Woohoo! And I say to myself, brothers and sisters, if my daughters can trust in that kind of father, then surely you can trust your heavenly father who's the complete opposite of that, who is in control, who knows what he's doing, who has unlimited resources, who has infinite knowledge. Surely you can. And so as you go out into this week, I want you to say to temptation, no temptation, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. You go out and say to fear and worry and doubt, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Oh Lord, we thank you for this psalm that has encouraged countless men and women and young people in every season of life. Those who are close to death and those who have just arrived in life and everything in between. Oh Lord, we live between these two hospitals of life and death, and you come, and in your grace, you meet us and you shepherd us in between these two hospitals and through them and beyond. Lord, I pray that the psalm would grip our hearts, that as we dig, dig deep and come to just meditate on these truths, as we go out tomorrow, Lord, we would emphasize each of those words, the Lord is my shepherd, and that, Lord, it would result in us being able to say, I shall not be in want. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your grace, Thank you for your sheepdogs called love and mercy that follow us all the days of our life. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for green pastures. Thank you for coming and finding us when we go back to those polluted sources. Thank you for not allowing anything to take us out of your hands. But that, Lord, you've promised that one day if we know you, that you as our good shepherd will lead us on, on to glory after glory, after glory, you'll invite us as sheep to come and sit with you in your house. What an amazing privilege, what condescension, what love. Work the psalm in our hearts, we pray. Amen.